Thank you so much. So welcome to all of you today, both here at the Hilton Chicago Hotel in downtown Chicago, as well as those of you that are joining us virtually around the country. Again, I'm Mary Dillon. I'm the chair of the Economic Club of Chicago, and we are all joining here today to hear from our guest speaker, Academy Award-winning filmmaker, Martin Scorsese. Okay. So, first let me introduce this evening's moderator. I've had the honor to have known and to have worked with Jeffrey Katzenberg for many years, going way back to my McDonald's days, when you might remember some incredible global Happy Meal events in partnership with DreamWork, DreamWorks. So back in 2009, Jeffrey spoke to the club at a dinner meeting, and DreamWorks had just released How to Train Your Dragon. And members got to see the trailer in 3D. Do you remember that? It was a big hit. He spoke about animation and innovation and how the transformation of any industry only comes by embracing change, which has been the hallmark of Jeffrey's career in the entertainment industry for over 40 years. So after serving as president of production at Paramount Studios, he became chairman of the Walt Disney Studios. He then co-founded DreamWorks SKG with Steven Spielberg and David Geffen. And all of us who are parents and grandparents thank him for bringing Shrek, Kung Fu Panda, Madagascar, and ants to the world. And my daughter, my youngest daughter is named Fiona. And for the record, she was named Fiona before Shrek came out. But everywhere in the world we went, they called her Princess Fiona. So she thanks you for that, really. So Jeffrey is currently managing partner and co-founder of WonderCo, a holding company that invests in, acquires, develops, and operates consumer technology businesses. So we really appreciate Jeffrey being here today. What an honor. And speaking of honors, let's now talk about our very special guest speaker. So, born from Sicilian immigrants and living in Manhattan's Little Italy, Charles and Catherine Scorsese's young son, Marty, was supposed to be a priest. But fortunately, thank you, he did not do very well in the preparatory seminary, I'm not sure why. Uh, he was, well, I do know why, he was expelled at 15 years old for being the class clown. Do you guys know that? Okay. As a kid, he couldn't play sports because of his asthma, so his older brother took him to the movies most Saturdays. So he found his way to cinema at NYU, where he received a BA and an MA. In 1967, he wrote and directed his first film called I Call First, later retitled Who's That Knocking at My Door, debuting the young actor Harvey Keitel. So it all began. Mean Streets, Alice Doesn't Live Here Anymore, Taxi Driver, Raging Bull, The Last Temptation of Christ, I'm gonna keep going, Goodfellas, The King of Comedy, Age of Innocence, Gangs of New York, The Aviator, wait there's more, Silence, Casino, The Departed, Hugo, The Wolf of Wall Street, The Irishman, and the upcoming Killers of the Flower Moon. So, Martin Scorsese has he has defined the modern gangster movie, continually works with actors that are etched in all of his films and all of our film memories, right? Joe Pesci, Robert De Niro, Harvey Keitel, and Leonardo DiCaprio, to name a few. In 1990, Scorsese created the Film Foundation, which is a nonprofit film organization that collaborates with film studios to restore prints of old and damaged films. So the foundation has restored more than 925 films from around the world and conducts a free educational curriculum for young people on the language and the history of film. So every month the foundation releases a newly restored classic film to the public. So today, if you were not here, you could be watching Marlon Brando in one Eye Jacks. So next month, the foundation will release John Huston's Moulin Rouge, and there's a card at your table with details about the foundation and how to watch Moulin Rouge on November 14th. So please join me in welcoming to the stage Jeffrey Katzenberg and Martin Scorsese. So I, I do want to say that, you know, when that train went out, Marty went, wow. <laughs> I like, yeah. Wow, how do we do that? <laughs> so, um... You know, I do have to just say, uh, regrettably, um, you know, um, our, our, um, our guardian angel, Melody, is not here with us um, tonight. And um, I'm here to be her apprentice. Uh, and um, uh, I'm actually very happy to be back here. Uh, it was 2009, the last time I was with you. Um, 
So I think it's safe to say that that reel, uh, you know, blows us all away when we uh, are reminded at how many unbelievable movie experiences uh, this man has brought to us over years and decades. And um, Thanks, Jeff. <laughs> so I've had to struggle with um, what would be the best way to tell the Marty uh, story here. And I, I thought maybe I would do it in three acts. And so I've tried to break this up. Act one is actually to um, who you are. Um, uh, act two is the filmmaker and storyteller. Um, act three is the film lover. And finally, as uh, a um, homage to Melody, we will have uh, a speed round, because we always have to have a speed round. And uh, so that's, that'll be our bonus round here in this. So with that, Marty, maybe just uh, to start with, um, we are in Chicago. Uh, well, yeah. Talk a little yeah, bit I mean, about- Chicago is very uh, instrumental, a very, very important um, uh, place in my life. I know back in 1967, uh, Michael uh, Kutzka, uh, the, the Chicago Film Festival, was, was the place that showed my, my first attempt at a feature. At that time, it was called I Call First. And um, uh, the film critic, Roger Ebert, uh, gave it a rave review. Uh, and uh, this sort of set us off on, on a... On a on a long journey. Later it became, who's that knocking at my door? I got to meet Ro Roger and that sort of thing. Um, uh, we became friends. Uh, uh, Chicago was also a place where my uh, uh, daughter Domenica lives and my granddaughter Serafina and her husband Tony. Um, uh, it's a uh, um, very special place for me. Um, we even made a film here, Jeffrey, together. The Please. Color of Money. Yeah. Then we have a thing called the uh, Scorsese Katzenberg trilogy as yes. uh, Last said. Temptation of Christ, The Color of Money, and his acting uh, uh, in our movie Shark Tale. Shark Tale. <laughs> I was the puffer fish. <laughs> Sykes. He wrote that for me. But I, 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 I had to just say a little about Roger and uh, what he Please. meant to me. And uh, I don't know, you know, the thing about it, uh, if I could just read a quote that he wrote about. You know, he's an Irish Catholic guy, right? Um, and, um, okay, so I'm Sicilian Catholic, all right. Um, <laughs> but he wrote something about Departed, and it just stuck with me. And he only, he wrote, Departed was only about 10 years, 12 years ago. So all this time, uh, he says, I've often thought that many of Scorsese's critics and admirers don't realize how deeply the Catholic Church of pre-Vatican II could burrow into the subconscious or in how many ways uh, Catholicism in his films is so important. Okay, um, not that you have to know that, but it seems to be there. Uh, this movie is like, this movie, Departed, is like an examination of conscience. When you stay up all night trying to figure out a way to tell the priest, I know I, know, I, know I done wrong, Father, but, oh, Father, what else was I gonna do? <laughs> and at the end, as you know, of that particular film, a lot of people pay for it. But he understood. <laughs> yeah, they couldn't do much more. Um, but what, he, what I'm getting at is that Roger gave me the hope because he gave me support because he, uh, I think he, uh, he understood where I was coming from as, as a pre-Vatican II Catholic. Because um, so, he was Catholic. So Whether he liked the film or not, he was always constructive. So maybe uh, let's talk a little bit about those roots. Um, yeah. You know, you're... I've heard you talk about, you know, really sort of your introduction to movies were through your brother and your father. Oh, my father, yeah. Right, and so how, tell us Well, the... they couldn't do anything with me. <laughs> they, I was three years old. Uh, we were living, uh, my mother and father were born on Elizabeth Street. My father in 241, my mother in 232. That's between Prince and Houston. The buildings are still there. They cost a fortune now if you want to live in them. But they were born, uh, uh, you know, not in a hospital, in those rooms. And, uh, they, and when they were married in 1933, they moved out and moved to Corona, Queens. And I have an older brother, Frank, uh, who's seven years older. 
Um, and uh, they also come from families, immigrant families, where they had seven or eight children on each side. So by 1933, they didn't want to be living with that group anymore, so they had two children. They all worked it out, three children. You know, that's what all the aunts and uncles kind of cut it down, become Americanized, you know? Um, in any event, uh, I um, uh, grew up uh, in Corona for a few years, and then we were forced to move back to Elizabeth Street. And Elizabeth Street at that time is not what it is now in New York, which is a very chic neighborhood, and it's very, very different. It was very rough, and it was right next to the Bowery um, with an L. Uh, it was hellish. You know, the Bowery was called the Devil's Mile, and we were on Elizabeth Street, and Mulberry Street was called Murder Mile. So I was in the middle. <laughs> I was eight years old. I couldn't, uh, at three years old, they, they took me and took up my tonsils, and next thing you know, I got asthma, and I almost died. And so from that point, they coddled, coddled, coddled me and put me in rooms. I couldn't laugh, I couldn't run, and I, I certainly couldn't play with the other kids. So there was nothing else they could do with me. It was taking the movies. And so from 1946 to 56, basically my, my experience was sharing these extraordinary emotions uh, with either my father or my brother taking me to films. So um, it, that, that was the place of, of respite, so to speak. So about a bajillion people uh, love movies, but not a bajillion people actually know how to make movies. Why did you think, having watched them, that that was a career for you? That what, what made you think, okay, there's no way I can do that. There's no way that that was gonna be a career. That's like going to be an astronaut or something. We were in a you know, lower working class family. My family didn't have books in the house. I started getting books. Um, and uh, the movies were fantasy, there's no doubt, but I saw reflected, particularly in the darker films, even films like Sunset Boulevard or uh, you know, uh, in a lonely place, or the noir films, which were normal films at the time. They weren't called noir, they were regular films. You went to see them, kids were shown Gilda constantly. Gilda, it's a totally perverse film, you know? <laughs> we saw it constantly, what is going on in this film? It was amazing, but in any, in any event, years later we figured out, but in any event, um, the, uh, the scene to me, that the expression of telling a story, and I saw people tell story, they were great storytellers, my father, my mother, Kids on the Corner, some tough kids who would tell stories you, uh, were amazing. And I learned about acting from them and how to tell a story from them. And these stories were things you didn't see on the screen. And the only way I knew, if I wanted to tell a story, the only way I knew to try to uh, use uh, uh, elements to tell were pictures. So I made my own little drawings, storyboards, um, alone. I didn't show them to anybody. Um, we're living in a very, very small apartment. Um, the, other, the other way out of that life, uh, because it was a very rough area, and let's face it, it was, it was, it was uh, uh, mired in organized crime, uh, different, apparently different crime families in different blocks. I only learned this a few weeks ago, too. Some people, oh, that, that club was so-and-so. I didn't, oh, really? I didn't know that. You know? <laughs> but I knew to stay away or to be respectful in certain ways. The only way was to... Uh, um, uh, either, you know, go into making films, which was out of the question, so 1953. Where, 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 when did you get your first camera? Well, I never got a camera. We were too poor, couldn't get one. I borrowed from my friend whose who family had a little more cash and I would borrow and shoot it, you know. But the other way was this one priest who was a uh, great influence on my life, Father Francis Principe, who was about 24 years old. Uh, he was in uh, the neighborhood of St. Patrick's Old Cathedral. It was the first Catholic cathedral in New York. So it's a very special place. And uh, he, was, he was the new man. He would tell us, you don't have to live like this. You don't have to, you know, uh, we see what goes on now. You get, you get married, you go to live in Staten Island. You, go, you can maybe take advantage of education. And he started giving us books. Uh, um, you know, Dwight MacDonald, uh, uh, Graham Greene. Uh, I picked up James Joyce. And we started getting crazy because the Irish culture was very, very important to us through American cinema, you see. So the similarities were very, very much there. Uh, so these two things, either you can put them, as I pointed out one point, I told once to Gore Vidal, who was doing a project, I, I didn't realize, you know, Gore Vidal has, he had quite a, quite a wit about him, 
um, I said, you know, in my neighborhood, I was joking, right? In my neighborhood, you could be one of two things, either a priest or a gangster. He says, good, you became both. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, just a little sidetrack there. So you got thrown out of seminary. Gore got it. Is, is that something that you could share why yeah, I, and how in mixed company? I can't. Yeah, no, you, no, I didn't do it. You were a bad boy, no, obviously. No, none of that. <laughs> no, it was rock and roll that did it. It was, you know, in the beginning, right, of my 78s of Chuck Berry and Fats Domino. No, I thought I wanted to be like this priest. I wanted to be like him. He knew the way, and he also knew the way spiritually. He had a thing about how one should live, live one's life, how you should treat other people. Uh, my mother and father were very good about that, but what I saw in the street was very different. Very different. So let's, let's do, let me read you a quote here. Um, so Mean Street, which obviously draws pretty significantly from those observations of growing up on, on the streets of New York City. But you wrote here, uh, a quote from you is, I don't think I've ever sat down and watched Mean Streets from beginning to end again. It's too hard. Yeah, it is. Why? I, I would like Francesca to see the picture, but uh, I don't, I, I like watching the beginning. I like the music and uh, uh, the Ronettes uh, and, <laughs> and others. But uh, uh, my problem was that I realized that the way out through a uh, religious order was not about yourself. It was about helping other people. It was about giving yourself up to other people. I didn't know that and I wasn't prepared for it. And you can't do that just because you want to be like somebody who meant something to you. Right. You have to find your own way. So I pulled together over a period of years the story of Mean Street, which was based on a real thing. I mean, I got out of the car, myself and my friend, we got out of the car at two in the morning on Friday night, and we missed the bullets. The car got shot up at Astor Place over some stupid macho argument between some half a psycho named Crazy Butch and another guy. And I said to myself, the next morning, we, my friend and I said, this is ridiculous, we're on borrowed time. I said, I know, and I was at NYU at the time. And so I wondered, what the hell is it all about? What does it all mean? How could this life be this way? And then a friend of mine, a friend of ours, who was, eight, who was 18 years old, he died of 16, actually. He died of cancer. And I'll never forget, we went out to the Long Island Cemetery and, um, uh, it, it, thousands of graves, and there it was, the Continental Can Company overlooking it. And I looked around, I said, is this what it is? There must be something more to life that we can maybe pull out of this madness. You know, this poor kid, and that was cancer he had, and it was a different thing. But the bullets for the stupid argument that they said that, and I said, that's where the film should begin. We take that as the ending, and then we go to the beginning as to how each uh, element of the story built to the point where there was no more talking, it was just shooting. Over nothing, by the way. Insults, the pride, hubris. So how do you take this quintessential New York story and shoot it in Los Angeles? Well, that was Roger Corman. <laughs> <laughs> right. We shot seven days and nights in New York. Right. Okay, with a student crew. And then uh, Corman, told, that's why I did Boxcar Bertha. Before that, Roger told me, uh, I mean, Boxcar Bertha, I learned how to make a movie because I learned how to be on schedule. That was six days a week. Get up at a certain time. You don't feel like shooting, too bad. Shoot. You know, bring in the footage, you know. Uh, 24 days, that was it. And so prior to that, when we're making student films or independent films, you, when you got a camera, when the actor was available, you were able to shoot. But, you know, things didn't match. You, could, you were blowing the lights, you know. And um, here, it was a steady, pro and, and that's what he told me later, he said, you want to make this film, this is the, group, the crew you work with. And they said, we can make this in LA, the interiors in LA, with our crew that we did Bakkar with, and make it cheaper and faster. And that's what we wound up doing. Your parents ever see me in the streets? Well, yes. My parents, uh, finally in yeah, 73. Did they talk to you again after they saw they it? They spoke to me again, <laughs> yes, after seeing it. Um, uh, they, so, they were at the, the. So there's no, I mean, just. In the Scorsese household, there was no such thing as four-letter words, cursing. No, uh, this is interesting because later on I see movies about Italian-Americans, they're using the F word, MF, and all. I said, what is the, with these people? <laughs> if we had used, I'm not kidding, we had ever, even, the, 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 we'd get hit. You wouldn't, you, 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 
actually you wouldn't get hit. The emotional violence, the threat of it was enough. <laughs> my father was really, and my mother, how, how dare you? You know, mom, I didn't say anything, you know. And I didn't, I mean, you were gonna say it, no I wasn't. And um, <laughs> none of that, no C words, none of that. Um, and so uh, in Mean Streets, I said, we're gonna make a film with the vernacular, the vernacular, the gutter talk, because it's, I don't know if anybody's gonna see the film anyway, you know? And so we put it together, and my mother and father are there the opening night at the Mean Streets at New York Film Festival, and they're sitting there, and the curtain goes up, and, I, and we suddenly realized, oh my God, people are gonna see this. <laughs> you know, the other short films and things like that, yeah, yeah, but no, this is the feature. People are gonna see this damn thing. And after it was over, it was, a, it was a quite, a, quite a reaction, a good reaction. And because my mother had come to the festival a few times because I had short films there, she went out into the lobby of Alice Tully Hall. And uh, uh, people were walking up to, as, as she went by, each person says, I just want you to know, we never use that word in the house. <laughs> I, don't know the, I don't know where the hell he got it from. <laughs> but she was right, and she went to the next person, but don't you, your son's film, it doesn't matter. I would never use that word. All right, moving on, Scorsese, the storyteller. So you've made 27 feature films, 16 documentaries, seven TV shows, seven short films, two music videos, and eight commercials. That adds up to 67. So when you're making a film, is there a, a moment that you can actually tell movie magic is happening? Is there, is there that, that moment, yes, is it in know, the... I, 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 feel it, I feel it sometimes, Jeff, with the actors. Yeah. I, I, I come out of the, like people said, did you go to acting school? No, I didn't study any acting. I, I was immersed at the age of 14, 13 and 14 with the films of Ilya Kazan on the waterfront in East of Eden, particularly, uh, and uh, then facing the crowd. But those two were the ones. And I, I, I on the waterfront and East of Eden, and if I somehow... I, was, I didn't really say it until later, but I thought, my God, imagine being on, on the set when a magic like that happens between actors and something is not a film anymore, it's not theater, it becomes a kind of so universal truth. When was a magic moment? Just like... Um, uh, mean Streets with uh, Harvey and uh, Bob in the back room mm -hmm. where he's trying to convince him that uh, it's okay, I'm going to pay him. And it took a three and a half minute, four minute scene that Bob in insisted on doing, by the way, and that we squeezed in on the last day of shooting that improv suddenly became alive. Or when later on, years later, we're doing Irishman and there's uh, De Niro and Al Pacino. And I never worked with Al before, but there's this incredible scene with the two of them where they're at, a da they're at this big event and he has to tell Al, uh, Bob has to tell Al that he's got to stop it. Jimmy Hoffa, he's got to stop it. You're going to have to give it up, you know, because the group is saying it's what it is. And Al's performance, Al's reaction, it shows the depth of hubris. He says, you know, they will never dare. They wouldn't dare. He said, no, 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 this is, he said, they wouldn't dare. And at the end he says, remember, it's my union. It's my union, but they kill him. They kill him. And this, something happened on the set. I had two cameras and two takes, not even that. And the crew came around and said, that was something, wasn't it? I said, yeah some magic occurred. And that usually happens that way, you know? I enjoy kind of like a Cope, the Copacabana tracking yeah. shot. Oh, we enjoy, yeah. and we had so much fun. But these things would some people take it's off, or, or Kate Blanchett playing Katherine Hepburn at the, uh, in uh, Aviator. Yeah. Like, you know, whoa. I mean, suddenly I look up, I said, what the hell was that? <laughs> <laughs> whoa. So in shooting movies, um, you know, you, you can plan for everything that you can think of, <clears throat> and then things happen, right? There's just weather, a storm comes, blows oh. your sets away. You know, uh, yes. Spielberg always talks about, you know, shooting Indiana Jones, and literally his entire sets were destroyed. Entire, yeah, right, In which yeah. case, you have to improv and do, you have to create a miracle. Yes. Give us a miracle moment. Well, we... <laughs> Well, we had a lot of that. We were shooting this <laughs> extremely low-budget uh, project, Last Temptation of Christ, in Morocco. And the weather was, uh, at times, very difficult, and there were flash floods. Destroyed our entire set, uh, uh, at which point um, the uh, Temple of Jerusalem became an underground temple. 
<laughs> okay, it'll work. It'll work. Got the arches. We have the arches. Okay, you know. Uh, also, I couldn't get enough Roman soldiers to uh, uh, surround the temple courtyard, which wasn't a courtyard anyway because we lost the temple. We lost it. Uh, and so we got three stunt men from Rome that were with us. And so uh, he'd blow a horn, and I said, three guys jump up. And they come up. You know, like this, and we swish pan over. Three more guys. We swish pan. Three more guys. It's the same guys. <laughs> and then the Levite guards fight them. It was the same guys. <laughs> Every day, Jim. Same three. Same guys. Every day. Italian from Rome. They were Italian guys. Sure, Martin, we do. Um, let me go to two. <laughs> let me go to. Two uh, of my favorites, uh, if I can, and maybe just have you talk a little bit about what it was for you to grab them. So, Raging Bull, um, In the Ring, uh, uh, Sugar Ray Leonard, Jake LaMotta. Yeah. Um, uh, just, just a stunning uh, choreography and uh, the capture of that, the intensity of that. Um, I, I sort of felt as though you were in a figurative way, um, you know, it was almost like the crucifixion of, you know, Bob De Niro in that, yeah. in that scene. Yeah. And then there's that great line in which he says, I never went down, Ray. Yeah, that's a quote from the actual LaMotta. So you tell know, us a little bit about Sugar Ray Robinson, that. he went up to him in his corner, he said, I never went down. He never went, he took the beating. He was known for the extraordinary punishment, in fact, the announcer's voice you hear, if you see the film, you hear that announcer uh, calling the shots in, in, in the ring that announces the actual voice. And that, at one point he says, no man could take this punishment. But Jake felt so conflicted and, and bad about himself that he deserved to take that punishment as some sort of redemption. And he uses Sugar Ray in a sense. Um, but all of that, all of that was, uh, all those boxing scenes I never saw boxing. I, I used to see some of it on TV, but it was a little 16-inch uh, TV, and the, the figures were like this. And all my aunts, my uncles, and my father, yeah, get them, get them. And I said, what the hell are they looking at? I couldn't even see anything. <laughs> and then all I know is went on for hours. I couldn't see. And um, eventually, uh, when they got me involved with the project, I went down to, uh, they took me to a few fights, and I saw certain things. And I got close to the fighters, and I saw what happened. And I realized the only way I could do this is to be in the mind of the fighter, to be in the ring, and don't come out of the ring, to be, to perceive the fight um, as, you, as if you were fighting. So the sound would be stretched, uh, the motion would be elongated or, or speeded up. Um, uh, and so in a sense, that goes right back to two films, The Red Shoes, the ballet sequence of The Red Shoes, you know, some has been criticized sometimes by people at the time, ballet dancers, as not really showing the dance. Well, no, it's showing what's going on in the mind of Mara Shera, how she's experiencing the, the, the dance itself. And the other one was doing the last waltz, where uh, I broke up a camera movement to three or four bars of music. And that was the shot. There was no, in the case of uh, Raging Bull in the, bull, in the fight scenes, there were no three or four cameras. None. It was one camera, um, you know, a series of punches, lefts, rights, and then cut. And so the shots were all way designed uh, to take us into the mind of the fighter, you know. Amazing. That's it. Uh, it's another good example. It's another good example when you're sitting there and suddenly it takes off. So that was my question, which is how yeah. much of that was scripted? How much of it was rehearsed? How much of it was improv in the moment? How much of it was a magic moment? Well, I, you know, it really goes back to Matthew, you know. Yeah. Uh, and um, I, I saw this film, Mud, directed by Jeff Nichols, who's a good director. And, uh, uh, I didn't even recognize Matthew in it. I thought he was terrific. And then they came around and said he's, he'd like to come and talk, you know, maybe be in this picture. And um, um, yeah, we talked, there was something, something about the way he behaved that I thought if I could have that in this character, and behave meaning that there was a, a movement and a, 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 a choreography in a way that he had, 
and he was so cool that way. <laughs> and I thought it was wonderful. So um, told Leo, and uh, the script was written, Terry Winter. Uh, then we did, we added some more from the book, from the dialogue from the book, especially about some other scene, other stuff in the, in the scene. Um, and what we allowed him to do, as you can see, you know, they always say a comic is one thing, but a straight man is harder. So you see Leo being the straight man there. You know, it's very hard, and it plays off of him. Um, and uh, we allowed Matthew to take each point in the dialogue, in each line, and open it up, open it up. And he'd be, you know, uh, adding, I don't even know to the point how much he added, quite honestly, watching it now. Um, and it just <laughs> played so much, and Leo, the looks on Leo's face. Uh, and then at one point, it was happening, I think it was the second week of shooting, and things were going all right, but this was special. You know, it's a two, it's again, it's a table, two people at a table, a wide shot, a, a single, a single, what is this? They're getting, you know. Boring is it's what getting, they usually going, is. Yeah, yeah, boring. So I'm saying, I'm like, what the <laughs> hell? All right, look, okay, Leo looks like, yes, tell me. And the other guy is doing this, and then when he orders the liquor, it's fine, okay, that was in the script. We added more from, from the book, uh, and then, at one point, I'm on, I'm on a monitor, I'm looking. We did like six takes or whatever. And uh, Leo comes in, he goes, he's doing something. I said, what? <laughs> he does these sounds. I don't know what the hell it is. <laughs> I said, what kind of sounds? He said, they're like weird calls or something. And I, I, he, I don't know what they are. He's just sitting there doing it. I said, well, what do you want to do? He said, you want to see if he wants to put it in? So we see, we put it, I'm gonna tell him, put it in. What the hell is it? So we say, okay, we'll go there and pretend, you know, we go up to Matthew and say, uh, Matthew, you know those things you're doing? He goes, what? And he said, you think you can incorporate that? And he said, well, which things? I said, those sounds you're making. He said, well, those are just my vocal exercises. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, try to incorporate that. And that took off. That's... That took off, and that was one of those. <laughs> it was. It was one of those magic moments where everybody looked at each other and said, oh my God. <laughs> this film is a Western, Killers of the Flower Moon. Do you want to just tell us a little bit about that? Well, it's, it's it, the story, uh, uh, a book written by David Gran, who wrote The Lost City of Z, uh, that I think James Gray made a film of. Um, and anyway, it's about uh, the Osage uh, Nation in, 19, in the teens and the early 20s in Oklahoma, um, finding oil on their reservation, and that they had made a good deal, whatever minerals were in the ground, they owned. So they had the oil, and they became the richest people per capita in the world. Uh, now, the government stepped in and tried to make sure that they um, controlled how the Osage spent their money, by giving them guardians, by saying, well, look, you know, here's a, Here's a, a, a bowl of cherries there. How much, uh, how much, you know, we're gonna charge you. How much would you pay for it? Well, it's really only a dollar, you know. Well, tell them it's $10. The guy said, $10 for that. And the Osage buys it because they, quote unquote, don't have the value of the money. And there was a lot of resentment because the oil made them extraordinarily rich and they didn't have to work. They didn't work for the money. Um, having said that, the, head rights, they were called, um, uh, were inherited by the women in the family. So you had a lot of white guys coming down, marrying the women. Now, you know, it's a hard life, um, and it's uh, um, a situation where any, uh, you know, Europeans coming in and um, the indigenous populations being decimated, whether intentionally or not, and so they're going to die off anyway. So. Uh, these wives start dying. And the guys inherit the oil. Um, and ultimately, uh, there's two or three families that were very, very uh, involved in this. Uh, ultimately, uh, J. Edgar Hoover sent in his Bureau of Investigation at that time, 1922, I think. At the same time, the riots in Tulsa happened. It's only an hour out, out of Pahuska, which was the uh, capital of... Uh, the Osage County. In any event, um, they did 
They did catch a few. They, they uh, guys went to jail, et cetera, et cetera. But no one knows to the, to the extent now exactly what happened. The oil dried up. The oil dried up in the early 30s. But they're doing well. We shot in Oklahoma last year uh, with the Osage, uh, with other indigenous groups, and uh, with DiCaprio, uh, a young actress named Lily Gladstone uh, from the First Nations in, in Canada, and De Niro playing William Hale, the king of the Osage Hills. They, all real characters. Um, and Jesse Plemons, and it's quite something. In fact, the uh, Hoover took this, um, uh, this job, so to speak, uh, of finding out who was doing the killing and made that the basis for the FBI. And the FBI grew out of that. You know, they even had radio shows later uh, on gangbusters and things like that about the Osage. Fantastic. I uh, look forward to seeing that for sure. Um, I'm going to make a big leap here. You made one of the greatest music videos, I think, of all time. Bad with Michael Jackson. Yeah. I, I, we need to speed things up a little bit here, but what was that like working with, with Michael? Because I want to jump into your film preservation. Uh, it, was, it was really wonderful. Um, and what was great was putting him through the paces, acting. And that was the first film that Wesley Snipes did. Yeah. And, um, oh, a number of other guys. And it was just uh, the acting uh, written by Richard Price. Um, and ultimately, uh, the dancing sequences, Mike Chapman shot it, the guy who did uh, Raging Bull and Taxi Driver. Uh, the dancing sequences were so wonderful. And it took three weeks alone just to do the dance uh, again, very much like Last Waltz, where we did three or four bars or five or six uh, movements of the dance and then cut. There were no seven or eight cameras. Um, we shot in uh, the, um, uh, one of the subway stations in New York uh, with the low ceiling, which is a little bit of a borrowing of Boris Levin's incredible uh, production designer, West Side Story. Talk a little bit about film preservation, yes. which is so near and dear and important to you. So. Well, because, um, because as I say, I learned a lot about the world, or at least an introduction to the world. That doesn't mean you believe everything you see in the films, but it makes you curious as to who they are and what this is and what that piece of music is and what that painting means and who that character really was. And that's sort of through cinema and through films on television. I saw that people say, Marty's always watching TV. I'm watching films on TV. That's where we saw so many. Uh, in any event, um, um, for me, it was such a uh, life changer in a way, particularly when the independent films be, were able to be made in the late 50s with John Cassavetes making Shadows and Shirley Clark doing uh, The Cool World. Um, and the, the, the cameras got smaller and you were able to actually make films because other, before that, you would have to go to Hollywood to do it. And so... Um, Granted, I knew I was never going to make the films that I uh, like, the films I loved, like the filmmakers of old. I would never even be in the same category. And that, as you get older, you certainly realize, you know. Um, but you can make your own. And so for me, the inspiration for that, which took me out of where I was, and I saw some other people, the same thing, saving them and their lives. For me, that inspiration was really important. So you've, <clears throat> so you've restored 950 900, some We were involved with 950 yeah. of them so far, yeah. Um, how, do you, how do you pick the ones to restore? Well, at first it was, you know, for example, the bigger ones like Lawrence of Arabia was Bob Harris did that and uh, Spartacus and uh, um, Bridge on the River Kwai, things like that, that we, we um, uh, the big title films because I learned in the mid-70s when I went out to Los Angeles that these films were being, um, well, things were changing. The whole Hollywood system had gone. And basically, the films were being uh, neglected to the point where the color was fading. And that's sort of, it's one of the reasons I did Raging Bull in black and white. The color was fading. And at that point, they said, you have to make all the films in color. I said, in the meantime, I'd kill myself telling a story with colors. And in six or seven years, the colors are gone. So what the hell, you might as well do it in black and white. And that was a big issue. Um, and uh, what eventually happened was that um, um, I called together filmmakers around the world to protest this. And this was in 1980. Uh, protest this issue of color fading and how films are being neglected. 
because of uh, the inspiration they give from people around the world. Um, and I always point to this out too, Jeff. If you're inspired by Jules and Jim, let's say, if Steve uh, Spielberg, he loves uh, Ikaru, let's say, uh, or uh, Seven Samurai, whatever, um, uh, or Eight and a Half, um, look what Steven does. But he's inspired by that. Yeah. See, you never know where it's going to go, you know? And it's so, history. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so you have to keep those things alive. You want to talk about this? Yeah. On what we table? do now, we have on, uh, on the, uh, the Film Foundation has finally put together um, uh, a screening room, the restoration screening room, which you can register for free virtual screenings uh, on uh, uh, the internet. Um, this month, I think we're showing One Eye Jacks, the only film Marlon Brando directed. Um, beautiful restoration that Spielberg and I did. Yeah, like I'm gonna say, I didn't do, we didn't do it with our hands, but we, we, <laughs> we were looking and changing the color and grading and that sort of stuff. But in any event, uh, you can watch it for a month, and also there are uh, other um, elements on, on, on the, in, in the, uh, the screening room, which is filmmakers talking about the films, archivists talking about what this, what this does and what it doesn't, okay. et cetera. Uh, the big thing now is that we pushed out to restore films from around the world in countries that don't have the facilities, like um, uh, uh, Mali and uh, Indonesia and uh, uh, India to a certain extent. Um, uh, we just, uh, Africa, Africa, a number of African films are quite something. It's called the World Cinema Foundation. And uh, we're restoring, uh, we've restored over almost 40 films, which are very difficult because you've got to find the family. People have to go to India, people have to go to Africa to find the people and then work out the details if the negative exists, see. Speed round. We got to do it really fast because they right. want to go home. Okay. Ready? Right. So these are. The speed round. Oh, okay. <clears throat> we'll stay here as long as you want, but I'm going to get through the speed we round. Can get going. That's the thing I wanted to. I want to just say one more thing about those World Cinema Project films. The thing about it was that when I was a kid, I was seeing all these movies, and I would see uh, films made from uh, by British and French and Americans of India and Africa and places like that, and the people who lived there were always in the background. And then I saw Pate Panchali, Sajit Ray's films, on TV. And I realized that the people in the movie were the people who were usually in the background. And I'm learning more from them than these other pictures. <laughs> and so that was the thing. Yeah. We actually have a little clip. It's not so little. It's about five minutes or so that shows the process of restoration here. Um, but I'm going to do the speed round first. And okay. so if people want to slip out, you know, I'm, 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 yeah, you I'm nervous on. about the timing here. I'm on a clock. So, and you know... Melody, she ain't gonna have with me. I can't handle the, the okay, abuse. I never did a speed round before. This doesn't sound very, I don't know. It could be painful, I'm I not know. sure. I know, he's gonna I, really hurt me now. Okay, all right, here okay. we go. What's your all-time favorite film? Uh, Red Shoes. How many times have you seen it? Uh, I can't count them. Is there someone, uh, is there a movie that someone else made that you wished you had made? Eight and a half. There are more. There's so many. I'm just doing the speed round. All right. <laughs> it's, like, it's like, who's your favorite? It's like, who's your favorite child? Are you kidding? I mean, come on. <laughs> Is there a movie you wished you hadn't made? You don't know. I, there hasn't. No. What happened happened. I can't. I can't shy away from it. You can't say that wasn't me. It was me. Do you prefer to binge? or parcel out TV? Do you TV? Yeah, you I, I it? parcel it out. You parcel it out. Yeah, okay. except that there's COVID uh, shutdown. <laughs> okay, what, do you, what are you watching now? Um, I watched two, the other night Dairy Girls. <laughs> Those nuns. <laughs> do you have a favorite TV show of all time? Uh, I, Claudius. The original series that went on that started the whole thing. Have you, so you, what you don't know is, is that Marty um, wakes up wearing a three-piece suit, <laughs> spends a day in a three-piece suit, goes to bed in a three-piece suit. Everybody else wears, you know, jeans and T-shirts and stuff. So what's with that? Well, you know, I did, 
I did wear T-shirts shooting in the summer, I can tell you that. <laughs> but um, I like the idea of, um, you know what it is? I had this, uh, it, 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 the fantasy of the old director shooting in the studios. And you always see pictures where they're dressed. Yeah. And I thought that was so gentle. Did you ever wear them in boots? Yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, real good. Uh, where I had, I had them for, uh, for the Oklahoma picture. Yeah. But they were dressed, and the cinematographers, um, and I thought that had so, it was so... Uh, elegant. Elegant, and, and, and I don't want to say civilized, because we're making <laughs> movies, but, yeah. you know. Okay, so you work nonstop. <clears throat> You're nervous about flying. You avoid the number 11. You talk scary ass fast. Do you relax? And if so, how? Uh, <laughs> uh, music. Music. Music, and over the past, I think, 12 years meditation, actually. You just force yourself in the morning, you know, get into oh. it. <laughs> Marty Scorsese. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank 